So uh, I'm Chris Kennard. I'm a natural resource specialist at the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant Bufferlands. And I work with a team that manages the habitat and uh, has done uh, hundreds of acres of restoration projects and uh, managing habitat for wildlife there. And the buffer lands is surrounding the Sacramento Regional Wastewater Treatment Plant between South Sacramento and Elk Grove. And the wastewater treatment plant is about 900 to 1,000 acres of treatment plant facility in the middle of a approximately 3,500 acre property. So the, the species I'm talking about tonight, uh, and if there are any exceptions, I will let you know, are species that are uh, going to turn up or turn up regularly or there right now on the, on the buffer lands. And I'm not gonna get too, too much into this because I want to, uh, get through the talk in under an hour and have time for questions. And this is, uh, as I started to say before we started recording, I think, uh, this talk came out of a talk about a month ago that was covering a uh, kind of a survey of all of Bufferland's birds. And we ended up, or I ended up getting rushed at the end because of time. And I wanted to focus on some of the species that were neglected and what are uh, some of my favorite species. So the buffer lands itself now has, uh, we've recorded 244 species on the property. And even though the property is very flat and low elevation on its face, doesn't have a lot of habitat diversity, it's still, uh, it still really does between grasslands, wetlands, riparian forest, uh, which includes um, willow cottonwood riparian, as well as oak woodland and oak riparian, and also uh, seasonal marsh and uh, permanent uh, marsh, uh, cattail and tule type marsh. So uh, there's quite a bit of habitat diversity in that 3,500 acres, and hence the, the really to me now, impressive number of species that we've had on the property. So this is going to be a fairly sparrow heavy talk, at least to start with. And it's uh, going to focus on wintering birds and with a few exceptions. Now winter season, you see that's a bar chart from eBird. Uh, of the white crowned sparrow occurrence in our area. And there are a couple stray lines in May, June, July, August, but those are individual sightings over the past you know, 10, 15 years in the Sacramento region. These are from uh, Sacramento County observations. And so you can see it's about as common a bird as you can have. The, the bar chart doesn't uh, it's completely full, as wide as, as it can be, uh, to show that the white crowned sparrow is a very common bird. Uh, starting in September through the fall uh, and into the middle of spring, really, into the first week of May. But the numbers do start tapering off by the end of April. Uh, the white crown and golden crown sparrows are where I'm going to start, and then we'll we'll move out from there. There's a the large picture is the uh, adult white crown sparrow with that characteristic uh, black and white stripes on the head, and then in the lower left, uh, immature white crown sparrow, which has a more kind of rusty brown uh, stripes in a pale crown, but it's not, uh, it's not white, it's kind of gray, as well as uh, pale on the sides of the head. The uh, sparrows look like that, the immature from shortly after they hatch, they molt and look, get it in that plumage and retain that uh, through their, their first visit with us here. 
and then the, the following, when they return again, they'll look like an adult. So the other species is the uh, somewhat similar looking, but yet distinctive golden crown sparrow. And I'll talk a bit, little bit more about telling the two apart. It gets a little more challenging with the immatures, uh, immature golden crown on the left, immature white crown on the right. Uh, one of the most helpful quick uh, ID cues is the bill color. The golden crown sparrow has a kind of a grayish bill. Sometimes that's referred to in the literature as horn colored. You imagine sort of like a, a cow horn being that color, I guess. Um, and then the uh, white crown sparrows are, are usually orange. Uh, some uh, groups are pinkish and uh, some are yellowish. And I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly. So I'm not going to get into a lot of terminology or Latin names. Uh, and while it, it's helpful to, to know that, uh, not just, you know, to be a smarty pants to have the scientific names memorized, but it, it does tell you about the relatedness of the birds and the crown sparrows, which uh, people will often refer to uh, you sometimes run into birders saying, well, there's a zone of trichia flock, which is just the same in our area as saying a crown sparrow flock, or a, sometimes people say a zono flock. Um, and it's, you know, another term, why not just say crown sparrow? Well, it gives you a sense of the relatedness. Uh, the first group of birds I'm going to be talking about are all in the sparrow family, the new world sparrow family. And then um, there are a few genera, Zonotrichia being one, that uh, is a helpful uh, grouping to learn these birds. So we've got the, the common ones, the white crowns and the golden crowns. A little bit more on that. Um, here's, here's our, our uh, little flock at a, a friend's backyard with seed. We have in the upper left a, a immature white crown with that uh, orangey bill, uh, another immature white crown below it on the left with an orangey bill again, and then a golden crown in the middle, and another golden crown to the right, and then an adult white crown on the right. And the bill, the bill color really pops out, as do the, the striping uh, going back really quick. You can see how the the pattern of the white crown sparrow uh, as an immature uh, really does stand out, even though it's not it's not as bright as in the adult. So, kind of an interesting aside on the white crown sparrow is you can actually see white crown sparrows in the area, meaning within an hour and a half or so of here. Uh, year round, but our regular wintering white crown sparrow is called the gambles white crown sparrow or the subspecies gambli, and it is uh, it breeds up in uh, Alaska and Canada, and just comes down here in the winter time. So they leave us for most of May, June, July, August, and come back mid-September. Then along the coast, there's a subspecies Nuttalai, and they're a year-round resident. And that way, well, if you're out at uh, Bodega Bay or Point Reyes in uh, July or June, uh, you'll see white-crowned sparrows all over the place, and those will be the Nuttalai. And they have a yellow bill. This uh, down here in the middle is an example. And the Pugetensis or Puget Sound white crown sparrow uh, is a migratory, but uh, is a relatively short distance migrant, and it also breeds along the coast to the to the north, so Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and they uh, do come down to our area in the in the fall and winter, but they're 
more or less indistinguishable from the, the nuttles. So the Puget Sound white crown and the nuttles white crown are uh, two separate subspecies, but they look almost identical. And they have a yellow bill. They're browner than the gambles, the gambles being the one that winters in Sacramento in really high numbers. And they have a little bit, um, tend to have darker stripes on their back. The uh, gambles, white crown, have that reddish brown color that is uh, characteristic over much of their, uh, their plumage. The stripes are that color, whereas on the uh, Puget Sound and the Nuttles, they tend to, tends to be almost black in the middle of the stripes down the back, like a golden crown sparrow's back. And then the other one is the Oriantha or the mountain white crown sparrow. And that's the bird that you see up in the high Sierra. If you see a white crown sparrow in the summertime, that's going to be the Oriantha. And they winter mostly in the Southwest. And so th it's tempting to think that the white crowns that you see in the mountains are the ones that you see on the valley floor, but that's not the case. Uh, it's a separate subspecies. They're the same species, but uh, very little interbreeding, especially between the that mountain white crown and the, the wintering uh, gambles white crown. So we could go on there, but that kind of gives you a, a sense of the diversity of, of the population. And then the, the last uh, subspecies that I didn't mention, the leucophries or leucophries is uh, in the, it breeds in the Northeast. It's the, the Eastern complement to the uh, gambles white crown and it uh, winters, uh, mostly in the east, uh, coming down in the, in the winter time. One feature about the, uh, the leucophries and the Oriantha is they have dark lores. So the lores are the area between the, the bill and the eye, and you can see how it's dark on the Oriantha, but pale on the, uh, on the uh, Puget Sound and the Gambles. So that's uh, a feature shared with uh, the eastern uh, white crown and the mountain white crown. So staying in that genus Zonotrichia are two other species that occur in our area. And white-throated sparrow is a bird I see on the bufferlands just about every year. And um, folks who are familiar with the property, the the forest on the west side of I-5 and over near the stables, there's usually a golden crown sparrow flock uh, that has a white-throated or two with it. They can be hard to find, but they're usually somewhere in there. And uh, but they're always a highlight when you when you go birding and you find a white-throated sparrow in our area. It's not an everyday occurrence by any means. And I'll go uh, you know, a month or more in the winter time, sometimes without seeing one locally. Uh, they're another just really interesting bird. They have a beautiful song. Um, they're the one that people say it's, uh, uh, oh dear Canada, 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 or uh, Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody depending on if you're a Canadian or an American. Uh, another interesting thing about them is there are two uh, morphs. There's the tan stripe, which looks like the one on the upper left, and then a white stripe on the, on the right, upper right. And most breeding pairs are a combination of the two. And there are, there are male and female white stripes and male and female tan stripes but they mostly uh, breed uh, as uh, one tan stripe and one white stripe in each group. And they're, uh, this is really interesting research that's come out in the last uh, few years, or at least become uh, more widely known. And they're uh, behaviorally a little bit different, and uh, the white stripes tend to be more aggressive, both the male and the female. 
and the uh, tan stripe tend to be uh, better parents. They actually, uh, you know, are more attentive to their young. And the mix of the two, it's a, it's thought to be a mutation, or a, rather a, a, you know, a, a set of genetic traits that are linked with the uh, color more. And I don't. I claim to understand the genetics there, but it's really quite interesting. The reason I included the photo at the bottom right is because it gives you a sense of uh, on the drabber end what they can look like. And going uh, even a little farther toward the drab end, here's a uh, very drab, possibly probably a, a first fall winter uh, white throated sparrow with a a zono flock, uh, zona trichia or crown sparrow flock, uh, the white crown sparrows and golden crown sparrows. And you can see the adult white crown on the right, and then it uh, looks like two uh, golden crown sparrows behind. Even though it's a crummy photo, you can, I just key on in that bill color for one. The uh, golden crown in the upper left is pretty obviously golden crown because of the, the golden crown, uh, but the other bird based on the bill color, unless there's some shading going on, even though it's out of focus, you can pretty much tell it is a, a golden crown sparrow. And another thing with our, our gambles white crown is the gray breast is uh, a good feature, uh, and especially to tell them apart from the, the uh, those coastal, the, nuttles and the pugitensis. What I didn't say on that, that slide when I was talking about that is that the um, pugitensis or puget sound uh, white crown is migratory and so they do come into our area in very low numbers uh, and you can find them in the, in the flocks and they their song is slightly different and they tend to be uh, more in the like the western part of the county, out near Ria Vista, Sherman Island, uh, fairly dependable with the uh, what we think are probably the Puget Sound uh, white crowns because the nuttles are non-migratory and stick right to the coast. So again, bathing in the puddle is the very drab white-throated sparrow. And then this is one that is on my wish list for the Bufferlands, but figured I'd mention it. This is a Harris's sparrow. This is a first fall winter Harris's sparrow that was found at uh, Jerry Langham's yard quite a few years back. And most of the birds that uh, are found locally, there's one in Davis right now, uh, they tend to look like this with a kind of creamy buffy face and uh, black uh, crown and a bit of a bib coming in, and as they mature, they get a more uh, full black bib. Moving on to another group now, um, there are just uh, three groups of sparrows I'll talk about in relation to their genus, and this is the next one. This is Melospiza, and there are three species in Melospiza in the world, and we've found all three of them on the bufferlands. The song sparrow is uh, one of my favorite sparrows, and it's one that it's a kind of a stretch to include it as a winter bird because it's a year-round resident on the bufferlands. But since I'm talking about sparrows, I might as well go through all of them. And they, uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, kind of, I feel like they keep me company in the summertime because they sing they sing year round and especially in the summer there when so many of this uh really all of the regularly occurring sparrows on the bufferlands leave other than the song sparrow uh it's nice to have them around they are another species that we could uh go on a tangent on uh there are i think it's 29 recognized subspecies and uh, in North America or in their whole range. And the, uh, there are year, one of them is a year round resident that breeds on the bufferlands, but we also likely get an influx of 
uh, one or two other subspecies, and they're uh, they're very diverse. Uh, just the species, the, the diversity of subspecies, from a huge bird that breeds in the Aleutian Islands to the very gray with reddish uh, uh, patterning in the southwest, and then very deep dark brown uh, along the Pacific coast. And the birds that are photographed here are our uh, regular breeding birds that are sort of kind of an intermediate uh, brown. Staying with Melaspiza is the Lincoln Sparrow. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's a, a subtly beautiful uh, sparrow, I think. Uh, they have a buffy wash on the breast and on the side of the throat slash neck. Uh, they're similar to a song sparrow, but they're more finely uh, uh, marked. Uh, Keith Hansen, the bird artist, has talked about how, uh, you know, when they painted the, the stripes on the, the uh, Lincoln Sparrow, they have, a, you know, used a finer brush. And you can kind of get a sense of that. They're a little smaller, a little more delicate bird than the Song Sparrow. And that's the Lincoln Sparrow. And they're, they're a bird that will show up in our area in late August, typically and then stay through about the end of April. And then they go north and, and some breed up in the, in the mountain meadows. And they have a beautiful song, which unfortunately they don't uh, exhibit too often uh, down here on the valley. This was a, a finally bird, a swamp sparrow. It's a beautiful bird. It's also a melospiza and they, uh, the bird in the lower right, the clearest photo, is one that spent several winters at Yolo Bypass. And I didn't hear that it returned this winter. But the other two photos are from the one and only that I've seen on the property. And that was just a couple years ago now. Um, and there's also one that was uh, misnetted by Stan Wright uh, on Stone Lakes Refuge. But they're uh, not annually found in Sacramento County, maybe just every few years. Um, and they tend to be, uh, all three of these species actually are often found uh, in the wetlands or in wetland margins. And this is a, a really nice, nice rarity and nice addition to our bufferlands uh, bird list. So uh, these are two species that are on the bufferlands bird list, but I'm mostly going to talk about savanna sparrow because I've only seen two vesper sparrows on the property. Uh, savanna sparrows are an abundant open country sparrow. Um, they often perch up on barbed wire. If you're driving through uh, grasslands with uh, barbed wire fences, these are likely the birds that you're seeing in really good numbers between the end of August and uh, early May. Um, they sometimes, one of my favorite places to go is uh, Meese Road in uh, eastern Sacramento County, just south of Rancho Cordova, and uh, sorry, Rancho Murrieta, and can easily see over 100 uh, in little flocklets along the, the seven mile drive there on Meese Road. And uh, Vesper Sparrow is a prize out there uh, that I always look for, but it's uh, easy to miss. And I don't see them every year, though they are reported every year in very low numbers. Um, one thing about the uh, Savannah Sparrow, is they often have uh, a little bit of, of yellow in the lores. Not always though, uh, but that's a good feature to look at. And they have uh, fine, fine streaks. Uh, it used to be, I don't see this much anymore, but it used to be that the bird books would make a big deal about the, what they called the stick pin and the central breast of the song sparrow. And I think that really confused people because, uh, you know, the savanna sparrow can have that too. 
but they're in very different habitat. They're uh, a small sparrow uh, that flocks in mostly in grasslands and grassland margins, whereas the the uh, song sparrow is a lot chunkier and um, tends to be in wetland and riparian areas. Then the vesper sparrow, just by contrast to the savanna, it's bigger. It has uh, white uh, outer tail feathers that are more noticeable when it flies. It has a little chestnut uh, spot on the on the shoulder, which is sometimes visible. And then more distinctive is the prominent eye ring and the pale wrapping around the cheek patch and a little dark border to the cheek patch. So it's uh, and I could spend a lot more time getting into the nitty gritty of these, but it gives you an idea of, of what we have. And the savanna sparrow is, is abundant and the, the uh, vesper is quite rare. So another interesting group, I'm gonna wear myself out saying that, uh, the so sooty fox sparrow. Uh, the, so the species fox sparrow has four uh, broad groups and sooty being the, the common one here. There are uh, quite a few uh, subspecies and these are Pacific breeders. They breed from the Aleutians down along the Pacific coast and then winter locally here. And the sooty fox sparrows tend to be a uh, brown, either kind of a milk chocolatey to dark chocolate. Sometimes they have some gray tones, sometimes they have some reddish tones, but they're fairly uniform. And they're, these are our, our common uh, fox sparrows. The three other uh, groups are the red fox sparrow, the thick-billed fox sparrow, and the slate-colored fox sparrow. Um, I have not seen a thick build on the valley floor, and I think there are a few records, but they are are very rare, but they do breed up in the Sierra. So there was talk for a while of splitting these into four uh, species, but the problem is where the ranges meet, the red fox sparrow breeds up in the uh, across Alaska and Canada. And uh, it meets up against the uh, sooty fox sparrow that's on the Pacific coast. And then the, the slate colored is in the much of the inner mountain west uh, going north. And it abuts the populations of the, the other two. And there's a lot of intergradation between them. And similarly, there's some areas where the thick build and slate colored come together. and uh, there are some populations that are hard to uh, lump in one of those groups. So that's kept fox sparrow from being split into four easy, uh, easy groups. The uh, red fox sparrow is really attractive. It's kind of a gray base on the face and, and back with uh, red uh, stripes on the back and uh, overall kind of just a red reddish appearance. The slate colored has a grayer head with uh, reddish in the wings and in the tail. And then the thick build is similar coloration to the slate colored, but with, with that thick bill. And they also have a call, a sharp call like a California tokey instead of a, a smack call like a big Lincoln Sparrow or a even bigger Junko kind of smack call that the other fox sparrow populations have. The uh, thick build seems like it would be the most obvious to split out. And so this is, an, but this is another instance like with the white crown sparrows where you can see fox sparrows here in the winter time and then go up in the Sierra and see fox sparrows, but there are different populations and you get very little intermixing between those, those groups. So dark-eyed junco, um, <laughs> we can't help but say yet another interesting group. And this is, uh, if you've been birding a long time, like back in the 70s, you'll, you'll remember 
there used to be uh, considered several species of uh, dark-eyed junco, and then they were lumped, and people lost several species to their life list if they'd traveled around a bit looking at juncos. But the Oregon junco is the common one we have, and they're they have the reddish brown back and reddish wash to the sides, and then the the, the either black or gray black hood, and that's our by far the most common bird in our area, junco in our area, and they breed in the Sierra as well as along the coast. And there's even uh, a little bit of breeding at Kasumnas River Preserve, which is uh, just started up since about uh, the late 90s. And uh, we get fair numbers, uh, when I say fair numbers, we get reports of slate colored uh, juncos. I just saw one uh, on, uh, what day was that? That was Monday at the Bufferlands. Yeah, and they're, you usually find them in a flock of Oregon juncos. And I apologize for the photo, but they don't have the reddish brown on the sides. And they have, uh, most populations of the slate colored have the a grayish hood that uh, blends with the grayish body. There is a population called uh, the subspecies assigned to it is cis montanus and it's uh, up up north uh, but interior of the coast range and they uh, up in uh, Canada and uh, primarily and they uh, may be a, a population of, of kind of a stable intergrade zone between the Oregon and the slate colored and they have a hood that stands out darker than the rest of the gray body. And then on the right of that, the females uh, have a little bit, it can have a little bit of brownish and they don't have as dark a head, but that's the, the female slate colored. And then the gray headed is uh, breeds just barely into southeastern California and throughout uh, areas in the southwest. And then you get farther down and you get red backed and go north of there and you get pink sided and in the black hills uh, you get uh, white winged so it's a a group with a lot of of it's it's a species with a lot of groups and with in each of those groups you can have uh, three or four subspecies but there is enough intermixing of the populations that they're not considered anymore to be separate species I've left a couple of sparrows toward the end because we just don't see them on the buffer lands that often. And this is one, the uh, lark sparrow. Uh, they, um, we probably have fewer than 20 records now in over 20 years of observations uh, on the property. They just don't breed there, but they're a, a beautiful sparrow, always nice to see there. And they're fairly common uh, in the eastern part of the county, like say around Folsom Lake and in the in the Blue Oak Woodlands. And the, I don't fully understand what their habitat requirements are because I find them uh, here and there on the valley floor, but more often uh, where they're more dependable is in the transition zone into the, into the low foothills. Uh, chipping sparrow is another that we don't get very often on the buffer lands, but they they do. There are a few places like Phoenix Field uh, off of uh, was that off of Sunrise uh, that area. Uh, they're getting regularly reported in the winter time on the buffer lands. We mostly get them in the uh, in the spring or fall migration, um, but they, they do show up in winter. And that bird in the upper left is a, a juvenile that was uh, fledged at Kasumnas River Preserve. It was the first breeding there, at least uh, in over a hundred years in the, for Sacramento County. And pretty quite unexpected. Uh, John Trochet found that as he finds most things at Kasumnas. And then just uh, real briefly, uh, so this is another one of the, the the groups or the, the genus uh, 
the genera that I was talking about. This is the Spizella group. And these are uh, the Chipping Sparrow and the Brewer Sparrow, which are both on our Bufferlands list, are uh, quite small, uh, long-tailed, with really high uh, call notes, and uh, often pretty secretive, uh, but are unobtrusive. But the uh, the brewer sparrow is quite rare in the area. They breed in the uh, in really good numbers in the sagebrush country on the east side of the Sierra. But they they turn up every year in Sacramento uh, County, and we have three records for the bufferlands. That one on the bottom was one that I saw while well, in the break room back when we used to eat lunch indoors, so remember those times, and uh, it was sawed out the window and it was on the fence, and that was probably our best uh, window bird at the, at the Bufferlands. And this is another, just kind of an oddball, the bird in the upper left is an immature black-throated sparrow, and that was just a really nice find uh, for the only one we found on the property. Uh, that's what, the, in the right, that's what they look like as an adult, and they, um, uh, you know, that's one singing, and and they're they're another desert dweller, but they occasionally show up in our area, and we just have the one record of an immature. Also, in the sparrow family are the tohis. Uh, the male uh, is the with the glossy black. These are. If they weren't so common, I think we would be amazed at how beautiful these are. They really are an exotic looking bird, but uh, if you've been birding a fair bit, you see see a lot of spotted towhees and you can you know, kind of ho-hum them, but they're really spectacular bird. And these are year round residents. I'm just I'm filling in the rest of the sparrows. The other two towhees uh, on our bufferlands list is the year-round resident California towhee. And uh, they are quite uh, localized on the bufferlands. They don't appear to tolerate long-term flooding. So the only place we regularly see them is on the uh, extreme west side of the property over where we hold walk on the wild side, west of I-5 and especially along the railroad track levee, on the old abandoned railroad track levee. And then the um, green-tailed towhee is a mountain breeder. And we have two records for the property, uh, both in the fall. And um, so we have some birds that are sparrows that didn't have sparrow in their name, like the towhees and the juncos. And then here's a sparrow that it's a sparrow, but it's not a new world sparrow. This is an old world sparrow, and they were introduced. Uh, I think it was uh, the idea was they would eat seeds and horse manure, uh, and they were brought in to uh, kind of as pest control along those lines. And then they, um, you know, have become widespread and actually compete with native species, but. Uh, they are quite uh, quite common in the urban areas. We don't see them on the bufferlands so much, and I don't see them in uh, quote unquote wild areas that often. They're usually associated with uh, human habitation, and that's true. Or these birds have been introduced around the world. <clears throat> now moving on to finches, and uh, I'm going to pick up the pace here. Uh, our house finches, these are year-round residents, but these are sort of our, our jumping off template for the uh, purple finches. And purple finches are stayed, have staged a big invasion this year. And so, um, hold on just a second, I gotta get a cough drop. So, um, the purple finches uh, that I photographed well, there was nothing wrong with them, but my photographs were kind of ho-hum. So Steve uh, genu uh, generously allowed me to use his photos, uh, Steve Scott, my coworker, and uh, he had nice series of them bathing uh, on the bufferlands. 
And you can see the female has a more distinctive uh, facial pattern than the, than the female uh, house finch where it's just muddier. I think they're easier to tell apart than the, uh, from house finch than the, than the males. But the males are, uh, they're not heavily streaked like the house finches often are. And uh, they're, they're a treat. We don't, most years, get that many on the bufferlands, but this year there have been a lot. And then uh, pine siskins have staged a big invasion this year. And, you know, they're often found around feeders, and there's been some concern because they've, uh, there's been uh, salmonella uh, outbreaks within the populations. It's spread by their feces. And so there's been an encouragement to take feeders down, but that's often where they are seen. And then they're often also in uh, areas with uh, cones uh, that are planted. Th these are a, a mountain bird that, that comes down to the valley, uh, especially this year in really high numbers when there's not, not enough food, uh, not enough uh, cone crop for them to eat up in the mountains. Got our uh, other finches or the goldfinches. Uh, so I've said before, well, in last talk, and I know not all of you saw that talk, but the uh, the bright male American goldfinch in the upper right, it only looks like that for a part of the year, and then it looks that kind of buffy buffy look uh, in the upper left for much of the year, and the lesser goldfinches are are more or less, are very similar looking, <coughs> excuse me, uh, year round. And they're, uh, they retain their fairly bright yellow. Uh, so that's a, a good feature. And the, another is the, the call notes of the species are, uh, once you spend some time with them, the little metallic uh, flight calls of the lesser goldfinches are quite distinctive. And then the kind of potato chip or chip, 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 calls of the American goldfinch are really helpful to tell them apart. We have now two records of Le Lawrence's goldfinch on the property. Um, there's a male and female at the bottom. And then that, that photo in the upper right was actually our first bufferlands record, a January bird. They're more common in the low foothills in the eastern side of the county around Rancho Marietta area in the spring and summer, and harder to come by in winter, but this bird just showed up in uh, January. And then I had one spring bird um, as two springs ago in April. Um, can't talk about winter birds without sending a brief uh, hello to cedar waxwings. These will be around actually most of the year, even though they don't breed locally. They'll show up as soon as August in the fall, and then you can see them into early June, sometimes little flocks. And they're very opportunistic on berries, but they also uh, catch insects out of the air. So uh, along the American River Parkway, in the wintertime when all the swallows are gone, you'll see large flocks of cedar waxwings flying around like swallows catching insects out of the air. Um, the Says Phoebe is our winter uh, flycatcher and it gets replaced in spring just in the next couple weeks by Western Kingbird. We're now sort of on Says Phoebe countdown before they leave the area and the Western Kingbirds uh, show up, though a uh, few Says Phoebes have bred in the region in the last few years, so that's a little bit of a change. Speaking of changes, the western bluebirds are, are breeding a lot more locally, and I put them into contrast with the mountain bluebirds. This has been a good, um, a good winter for mountain bluebird uh, locally. We haven't had one yet on the bufferlands, but we have several records. And they're, uh, you know, just this impressive uh, blue, uh, bright sky blue above. But I think it's because they're, you know, at least here a little more erratic. And so we, uh, 
you get excited to see a mountain bluebird, but the uh, western bluebirds are are equally beautiful. American pipits, another uh, kind of open country uh, fall winter bird, kind of on the same time frame. Uh, Horn lark breeds in the East County and also at, at some areas in the valley, but we only get them on the buffer lands in the winter time. Then uh, moving into a really common bird uh, locally is the ruby crown kinglet. This is a very common winter bird. It shows up a little later toward the end of September or early October. And then uh, they're rare to see in May, but you see them through April. And it's the males that have the red crown. And when they get really excited, they'll they'll open up uh, the crown and show a lot of that red. Uh, one thing uh, to note about kinglets, uh, the, the ruby crown and the golden crown, which will come up soon, is they have these uh, uh, yellowish feet, especially the soles of their feet are yellowish. So a lot of times, you know, people get confused. And I remember when I was learning these birds and looking for Hutton's vireos and thinking, well, why isn't that that ruby crown kinglet a Hutton's vireo? And so we've got Hutton's vireos on the right and ruby crown kinglet on the left. And one thing, uh, probably the, the most straightforward feature is that we've got two wing bars on the ruby crown kinglet. The upper wing bar is often hardly visible, but then it's black below the second wing bar. On the uh, ruby crown, or on the Hutton's vireo, almost always two bold wing bars and uh, black or, or quite dark between the two wing bars. They also have a heavier bill and a more spectacled look. They breed uh, in their year-round residence in the eastern foothills and at Kasumnis River Preserve but they only show up in very low numbers on the buffer lands in winter. Golden crown kinglets are a nice surprise and they are they can be hard to get a good look at or a good photo of because they often stay really high in the trees and they also have very high pitched uh, calls. And I'm finding, uh, not that I know it, except my wife Kimia says, well, wh what's that You know, high pitched sound? And I'd say, what's what? So I know I'm I'm uh, probably going to lose my ability to hear these uh, golden crown kinglets in the next few years. I can still hear them, but they have to be closer now. But very high pitch, like hearing test, high pitched uh, little calls. Um, we get uh, two species of uh, nuthatch, but the kind of the winter specialist is the red-breasted nuthatch and. They breed uh, and are, are mostly found in the mountains and along the coast in conifers, but do come into the area and occasionally onto the bufferlands in winter and as well as uh, spring and fall. And then our uh, red-breasted nuthatch is year-round resident. Um, just a few other uh, you know, interesting uh, occurrences. We get rock wrens. Uh, which are year-round residents in areas like Folsom Lake and rocky areas in the low foothills, but they do, uh, some of them migrate, like the ones that breed way up in the High Sierra, and we see them most winters in the riffraff along the levees or even sometimes in parking lots, uh, hopping around under the cars or in hay bales uh, where they'll spend the winter. Uh, brown creepers are uh, a nice find in the wintertime. Uh, as our uh, Pacific wrens, which we get them nearly every year on the bufferlands in the winter, but haven't had one yet this this year. The um, winter uh, warblers uh, that are really common are the yellow-rumped warblers. They're abundant. They and the ruby-crowned kinglets are the two species that really uh, kind of dominate the winter flocks. And uh, most of them that you're gonna find, especially you find around suburban areas or parking lots with planted trees are going to be the Audubons with their yellow throats uh, and they're on the right. And the Myrtle are more, uh, 
this is another species like the juncos I was talking about where these the myrtle warbler and the Audubon's warbler were considered two spe separate species and then were lumped. And the uh, myrtle, uh, it was similar uh, in a lot of ways, but it doesn't have uh, yellow in the throat. It has a white throat that wraps around on the sides of the neck and it has a darker cheek patch. And those are the two things that are most uh, conspicuous about them. They also have less white on the tail tip. So here's something if you're a, a more uh, experienced birder, might be a little take home tip. See this little, just a little bit of white on the, on the edge. I think this is partially shadow on this side. This is for a myrtle warbler. And then on the, uh, on the Audubon's warbler, the black comes together and, and touches in the center of the tail. And so sometimes you can only see them from below and you can distinguish them um, by that feature. Though that said, there's a little bit of, of intergradation and you'll see some intermediate looking birds. There's been some uh, discussion lately about maybe splitting these again. Very quickly, a couple of other warblers that we'll find uh, year round, uh, common yellow throat and orange crown warbler. Uh, though uh, the orange crown doesn't breed on the Buckerlands, they breed in the low foothills, but we find them from um, the late July some years all the way through uh, into May. They're really largely different birds, but they're definitely orange crown warblers moving through and some stay most of the winter in our area. Uh, bush tits, I just mentioned this because they often form the core of mixed species flocks that uh, you can uh, comb through to find uh, your rare warblers like uh, black-throated grays and Townsends. And these are the two uh, uncommon wintering warblers that are a treat to find. Uh, and you don't find them uh, every day by any means, but uh, they are regular and, and expected in very low numbers locally. Uh, Hermit Thrush is a, a mountain breeder with a beautiful song, but they winter in, in decent numbers and they're very uh, approachable and watchable bird. If, you're, if you just stay still, you can watch them forage and they're, <clears throat> they're a very enjoyable bird to have around. And then um, Buried Thrush is always a exciting uh, winter arrival, and they they show up uh, in good numbers some years and just about absent the others. And they're uh, I've heard people refer to them as fancy robins because they kind of look superficially like robins, and they're the same size about, but they're uh, you know have the different markings. They're also a lot more skittish. You don't see them in the open nearly as much. The females and immatures are a little paler. Uh, not as boldly marked, but still quite beautiful. And then there's a male in the lower right, and maybe he's not quite molted in to full, or not. Maybe it's his. He's a like first spring male because he uh, doesn't have a full black band across his upper breast like uh, like an adult male usually does. And that covers the birds. So. Uh, I'll open it up for questions, and you know, one resource that we have is uh, the website, and you can see the bird list and other aspects of the Bufferlands flora and fauna. And so, um, I think I made it in just under an hour. So, uh, Raja, if you want to unmute folks. Well, hey, first one question that got typed in. Ah. <clears throat> was asking about are all of the species that we looked at today in the sparrow family or just the juncos and the finches. So could you talk a little bit just about the families that we covered? Sure. So the uh, the first group I talked about were in the sparrow family, and that includes uh, all the sparrows, the junco, the tohi, except for the house sparrow, which is in the old world sparrow family. And then after that, um, we covered quite a few families. The um, finches, 
And then we did the thrushes, which are the uh, the bluebirds and the hermit thrush and buried thrush. Uh, the waxwings, another family. The pipits, another family. So yeah, quite a few different families, but the majority of the time was on the the, the uh, sparrow family and the finch family. Anything else? Do we want to unmute folks to uh, any other questions? If anybody okay. wants to ask a question, just unmute yourself and then ask okay. the question. And then if you would, just uh, mute yourself back so we don't get a bunch of feedback going on. I'm wondering if we could access the buffer lens by ourselves or do we need to go on a guided tour or how can we see the buffer lens? So the the buffer lens is uh, the policy is to uh, have only guided tours or a few um, few open trail days. And with COVID, that all came to a screeching halt and we're hoping, uh, you know, we're, we're kind of watching the the and as as the sanitation district uh who we're we work under uh watching the you know public health situation and we'll have to get uh you know buy off on that before we can have information uh, or have um you know tours again can you hear me chris yes chris? can you hear me chris yes i can I have a question. Um, Go for it. I saw a, a couple of on my lakes out here uh, off of Laguna Boulevard, what I thought were two tundra swans. Have you had any reports of 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 them in the area? Yes, uh, tundra swans are uh, are you know, a little farther south, like down uh, by uh, Woodbridge Road and at Staten Island, they're quite numerous. Uh, they on the bufferlands, we mostly get them as flyovers, occasionally on the ground. But one thing you need to rule out to be sure is uh, mute swans are also moving into the area. So look at the bill. If it, if it has any red in the bill or has a knob where the bill joins the forehead that's a it's probably a mute swan so i couldn't tell you which it is uh you know most likely to be but it could be either okay well it was definitely a black bill the <clears throat> other the other um choice would maybe be a trumpeter swan but those seem to be very rare yes very rare we've not not seen one i don't know if we have a a fully accepted record of trumpeter swan even for sacramento county but oh. uh but yeah mute swan or a uh, tundra swan and it sounds like you're describing a tundra swan yeah okay okay thank you welcome hey chris we got a question someone asked if if we've noticed any changes in in either the species or the numbers um, that we can attribute to climate change? You know, it's, it's difficult. Uh, there have been uh, documented range-wide reductions in some species. And the one that springs to mind uh, is uh, dark-eyed junco numbers are, are down quite a bit. And uh, like I said, you, you know, we could talk about them, uh, you know, they could be a talk in and of themselves. One of the interesting things about them is they have shown quite a bit of, uh, you know, behavioral adaptability in some areas of their range where they used to be migratory. They're staying year round to breed along the coast in Southern California, for example, and they just started breeding uh, at Kasumna River Preserve, but at a population level, their their numbers are down. And anecdotally, the junco flocks that I'm noticing are 
much smaller than they were 15, 20 years ago. And where I used to sometimes see flocks of you know, 25 or 30, now I'm happy to see a flock of a dozen. Anyone else? Yeah. All right, it sounds like we got it covered then. Hey, wait, wait, late breaking question. All when right. Do, when do pine siskins migrate? So I guess the question is when will they leave? So they could be here into early May. Um, it already appears that there are fewer than there were a month ago. Uh, our experience on the buffer lands is typically just a few in the fall, uh, you know, like September, October. And this, this year has been amazing where they've been, for a while they were daily. Uh, and the, the caveat there is they have a distinctive flight call, kind of a whiny little flight call. And if you don't know the flight call, you could easily overlook them because a lot of my detections of them on the buffer lands this fall was just as calling flybys or flyovers. But, uh, you know, oftentimes they'll just be two or three times in September, October. And this year they were steady from September through uh, not quite now, they're getting more sporadic, but Near my house along the parkway, they're still a everyday occurrence. Every time I go out, just about, I get them and purple finches still. Hey, someone hey. mentioned that they, they had seen some uh, bald eagles just a little south of us. Have we seen any this year on the on around the buffer lands? No, I don't know if we've seen any this year, but we certainly see them more than we used to. And they've, there are four or five nests now in the immediate area. Uh, well, immediate, within 20 miles of the buffer lands. And that wasn't the case. Uh, 20 years ago, there were maybe one or two nests out at Folsom Lake, but now they're, they're getting closer. There's one in West Sac, <laughs> there's one in, uh, in Folsom, one at Kasumnus, uh, one in the There's local three. hills, <laughs> one or two around Rancho Murrieta. So yeah, bald eagles are becoming a regular uh, regular uh, bird in our area now. Chris, can you add Chris? anything about the, the salmonella and the pine siskins? Um, Does it affect the pine siskins? Yeah. So it seems to affect the pine siskins just about every time we have a, a what they call an eruption where they're probably having a food shortage on their typical winter range you know up in the mountains or near their breeding grounds and so then they they you know just go exploring for food and one of the uh, great resource for them are bird feeders but it often will happen that uh, when they congregate, they get the salmonella osis uh, from the spread by feces. So as you know, birds aren't all that fastidious, and they'll poop on their perches, and it gets on their feet, and they they you know gets on one bird's feet and on the perch, and then another's, and it can spread, and it it can be fatal for them. So Periodically, there will be recommendations to take feeders down. And the latest I heard, I think, was still a, kind of a gentle recommendation to take feeders down, though I haven't heard a lot of uh, information about lo immediately local die-offs, but it wouldn't hurt to, to check on that. Just uh, Google, you know, salmonella and pine siskins and and see what the latest recommendations are on feeding them. Okay, thanks. And then Christine, someone, uh, Brian commented that um, it looks like a week ago, um, Jennifer on our staff had recorded tundra swans at the Upper Beach Lake. 
All right. I have a question. Yes. Nancy Rowan. Um, I have a, I had seen a hawk and I sent the, I got a good picture of it and sent it to uh, my uh, sister-in-law who's a birder. She identified it as a goshawk and said it was, those are very rare. And I said, she said it was quite a fine. Is that kind of a rare bird around here? Uh, where where did you photograph it? It was um, actually behind my son's uh, house. They have a in Lincoln uh, in a meadowy area, but it was up in a tree of a real it was, uh, kind of looked like it was after looking for other birds and stuff, little ones too. <laughs> So yeah, they breed in low numbers in the Sierra. Uh, they appear to be declining quite a bit, and I've only seen them a handful of times in California. And they're very, very rare on the valley floor, but they do occur. Um, the more commonly would be Cooper's hawks or sharpshin hawks. Uh, those two species. Are, are more common, but um, you could, uh, if you wanted to, email me or you got Roger's email uh, to get the, if you could uh, email him the photo, uh, he and I could look at it and, and see what we think. Because uh, uh, I know the guy who keeps track of uh, Placer County records would be interested in, in that report if it is a goshawk around Lincoln. Uh -huh. well, I, I used to have, uh, I don't know if it was just one, or but it seemed to have a nest, a Cooper's hawk in the neighborhood. Uh, well, a uh, couple of years ago, for, for like three years, it seemed to be coming back in my neighborhood, uh, uh, Foothill Farms area. Yeah, they, uh, they do nest locally. Your comment. Okay, thank you. I appreciate sure. this talk today. <laughs> Once I finally Great. figured out how to get on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, say so we wrap it up. All right. Thank you. Great job, Chris. All right, thanks for, thanks for uh, joining us. Thank you. Bye.